and welcome to our Wednesday Bible study. My name is Gerard and I'm a member of the congregation here at Swan Bank. Today we're resuming our Bible study on the book of Hebrews after we had that brief break last Wednesday for Helen Kirk's thoughts on Pentecost. Today's title is Jesus Like Who? And we are going to unpack that question, who is Jesus like? But first we're going to pray and then we're going to read from Hebrews chapter 7. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your written word. We thank you that we can come and meet around it so freely. Father, I pray that you will help us to understand something of the Old Testament law, something of the Old Testament priesthood, as it informs us and helps us to understand the law of Christ and the priesthood of all believers. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We have today a passage from verse uh, 11 through to verse 28 of chapter 7. I hope you've got your Bibles with you. We're going to read that in just a second. I should say to you, this is a difficult passage to understand. So buckle up. Here we go. If perfection could have been attained through the Levitical priesthood, for on the basis of it the law was given to the people, why was there still the need for another priest to come? one in the order of Melchizedek, not in the order of Aaron. For when there is a change of the priesthood, there must also be a change of the law. He of whom these things are said belong to a different tribe, and no one from that tribe has ever served at the altar. For it is clear that our Lord descended from Judah, and in regard to that tribe, Moses has said nothing about priests." And what we have said is even more clear if another priest like Melchizedek appears, one who has become a priest not on the basis of a regulation as to his ancestry, but on the basis of the power of his indestructible life. For it is declared, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. The former regulation is set aside because it was weak and useless, for the law made nothing perfect. And a better hope is introduced by which we draw near to God. And it was not without an oath. Others became priests without an oath. But he became a priest with an oath when God said to him, The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind, you are a priest forever. Because of this oath, Jesus has become the guarantee of a better covenant. Now there have been many of those priests since death prevented them from continuing in office. But because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. Therefore, he is able to save completely uh, those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. Such a high priest meets our need, one who is holy, blameless, pure, set apart from sinners, exalted above the heavens. Unlike the other high priests, he does not need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for his own sin and then for the sins of the people. He sacrificed for their sins once for all when he offered himself. For the law appoints as high priests men who are weak, but the oath which came after the law appointed the son who has been made perfect forever." I said it was a tricky or a difficult passage, so if you don't understand what you've just read, don't worry, you're in good company. I didn't understand it either when I first sat down to prepare this talk. But hopefully some of the fog will lift as we spend the next few minutes together and go through these verses. But no wonder in chapter 6, the writer of Hebrews describes things like faith, repentance, uh, baptism, uh, laying on of hands, resurrection, and the eternal judgment as the elementary teachings of our faith. We are now playing in a different league. So Jesus is like Melchizedek, and yet we know so little about Melchizedek. Outside of Hebrews, he gets just four verses in the entire Bible. Three of them come in the book of Genesis, and one comes in the, book, in the Psalms. He's an intriguing and mysterious and somewhat obscure character, and yet Jesus' priesthood is compared to Melchizedek's priesthood rather than the Levitical priesthood. 
So first, let's have a very quick look, a bit of a fly past, at why this comparison is made by picking up on the small amount, the tiny fragments that we know about Melchizedek from Scripture. Well, Melchizedek, he lived about 2,000 years before Jesus was born. That's about the same time between Melchizedek and Jesus as it is from Jesus to us. He has no recorded family history at all, and we're not going to go into some of the non-biblical legends that surround Melchizedek. He was the king of Salem, which means the king of peace. You'll remember that Isaiah referred to Jesus as the prince of peace. And by the way, Salem would later become Jerusalem. Melchizedek, it means king of righteousness. That is his name. So is Jesus. Melchizedek was a priest of God Most High, and Jesus is the high priest of God Most High. Melchizedek, he was born a few generations before Levi was born, so he couldn't be a Levitical priest. And as we will see, neither could Jesus or was Jesus. I like verse 10. and It is a unique way of telling us that Levi hadn't been born when Melchizedek bumped into Abraham. It says Levi was still in the body of his ancestor. When Abraham met Melchizedek, Melchizedek brought out bread and wine. That should sound familiar. Abraham gave Melchizedek a tenth of everything he had. Don't we also give a tenth too? Melchizedek blessed Abraham. Jesus blesses us. And Melchizedek's priesthood was royal and everlasting. So is Jesus' priesthood. So now let's take a, deeper dive, take a look, a deeper dive into the verses from 11 to the end of that section. Verse 11, it starts with what I call a rhetorical question. It asks, if perfection could be attained by adhering to the law and retaining the Old Testament priesthood, why was there a need for another priest? Well, the answer is simple, because perfection couldn't be attained by adhering to the law and retaining the Old Testament priesthood. For that, we needed an upgrade to both the law and the priesthood. Verse 12, of course, reminds us that the two go hand in hand. Replace one, and you have to replace both. So the old law would be replaced by a new law, and the old priesthood would be replaced by a new priesthood. Now, you might be struggling with the idea of perfection. Don't confuse it with being perfect. Christians are self-evidently not perfect. Perfection in this context is all about completeness. Verse 11 is actually saying, can the Old Testament law and the Old Testament priesthood actually do everything that's necessary for us to be in a perfect fellowship with God? And the answer is, no, it can't. Anyway, the notion that the old, the old priesthood um, would give way to a new priesthood shouldn't have come as a surprise uh, to God's people, um, not even the priests. You see, 500 years into uh, the Old Testament priesthood, which was still about 1,000 years before Jesus was going to be born, in Psalm 110, David wrote that God would make his son Jesus a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. And that's a phrase that, as we know, is repeated several times in the book of Hebrews. So does that mean that God changed his mind about the priesthood as history unfolded? Um, well, no, it doesn't actually. It just means it was always in God's plan to replace the old priesthood with another priesthood. You know, if uh, I plan to use a bike until I get a car, it doesn't mean that I've changed my mind when I eventually replace my bike with a car. It was always in the plan. Likewise, the Old Testament law was always a preparation for a new law to come. We call it the law of Christ. So this side of the cross, we're not under the Old Testament law anymore. And that means we won't be judged by it either. Just like in a court today, we're not judged by the laws that were in force a thousand years ago in the Middle Ages. 
But a cautionary note here. Although we know that Jesus came to fulfill the law, I think we're in tricky territory um, if we decide that that means all of the Old Testament law is now irrelevant and can be ignored. For instance, who of us would say that the Ten Commandments can now be ignored, that say um, stealing uh, and murder are now okay? Surely none of us would actually say that. Jesus did indeed bring a new law. We call it the law of Christ. Um, And it's commonly understood to be love your Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to love our neighbors as ourselves. And the Old Testament law actually helps us to understand how we might do that. So to love God and our neighbors, we can't ignore what God says about loving God and our neighbors in the Old Testament. That said, of course, some of the Old, Te- well, the Old Testament rituals have gone, okay, where we're no longer uh, required to do animal sacrifice anymore, and we certainly don't need a man uh, as a mediator between man and God. That's because Jesus Christ is the sacrifice and the mediator. The Old Testament food prohibitions, of course, have also gone. Verses in Mark chapter 7, Jesus' words, and in Acts 10, Peter at Cornelius' house, uh, confirm that. So we can eat pork and shellfish, though I'd suggest you don't eat them together. Another law that often comes up when people are discussing these things is the prohibition in the Old Testament uh, of wearing garments made of two different fabrics. Um, In the Old Testament, the only people who could wear a garment made of two different fabrics were the priests. But as that priesthood has now passed, that boundary has now gone, we also can wear clothes made up of more than one fabric. And mercifully, we're no longer required to carry out those severe punishments of the Old Testament law. Who of us would want the disturbing responsibility of casting the first stone to execute two people found guilty of adultery. We see in the New Testament how Jesus changed that when he spoke to the woman caught in adultery. The key thing is this. This side of the cross, we are to obey the law of Christ because we love him, not so that we can have a tick list where we say, yes, I've obeyed those commands successfully. And his grace, his amazing grace, that undeserved forgiveness that we get when we fail to love God and our neighbors leads us to genuine repentance. Grace, by the way, isn't a license to claim Jesus as Lord and then just live as we please. Anyway, back to Psalm 110. As we said earlier, if Jesus was like Melchizedek, the fact that Melchizedek wasn't from the tribe of Levi suggests that Jesus wouldn't be either, and he wasn't. A thousand years after that psalm was written, Jesus was born of the tribe of Judah. Now that upsets the apple cart, really, because all the priests in the Old Testament, except for Melchizedek, were from the tribe of Levi. That was the rule. And Moses' big brother Aaron was the first of those priests. So how could Jesus be a priest if he wasn't from the tribe of Levi? Well, he couldn't, at least not on the face of it. And in verses 13 to 16, the writer of Hebrews takes on that challenge. Summarizing those verses, the writer concedes that on the basis of ancestry, Jesus can make no claim to be a priest. That is in the old order of things. But then the writer goes on to present an infinitely more persuasive argument that Jesus' claim to be a priest comes from, what are those words? The power of his indestructible life in verse 16. Forget ancestry. They tried to destroy him, um, but he didn't stay dead. He got better. He was indestructible. Now that's the claim to be a priest in this passage. Verse 17, the writer repeats the phrase, Jesus is a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. And with that, Melchizedek disappears completely from our scriptures again. But we'll carry on briefly 
to the end of the chapter. Verse 18, the writer says, the Old Testament law was set aside uh, because it was weak and useless. It was weak and useless because although it was good, it failed to do everything that was necessary for us to be in a perfect fellowship with God. <clears throat> Verse 18 also says, the law made nothing perfect. Put another way, if you were to obey all 613 Old Testament laws, <clears throat> that wouldn't deliver the perfect fellowship uh, between you and God. And actually, it's still the case that nothing we can do can deliver perfect fellowship between us and God. That's because only Jesus Christ can do that. And we're going to come back to that. Verse 19 Notice the combination um, of priesthood and law gives way to a better hope by which we draw near to God. What a beautiful reminder that Jesus draws us near to God. <clears throat> Verse 20 is a bit confusing on first reading. It seems uh, it's a point that crops up again in verse 28. I think it's saying that no oaths or promises were ever made by God about the Old Testament priesthood regarding that it would last forever. But in verse 20, it reminds us that in the Psalms, God did make an oath about this new priesthood, that his son, Jesus Christ, will be a priesthood forever. That means no more upgrades. This priesthood is permanent, and it is here to stay. Verse 22 we're going to come back to that in a later Bible study. Verse 23. In the end, we read that death always stopped a priest from, one, being a priest, and two, serving as a priest. But death didn't stop Jesus being our high priest or continuing to serve as our high priest. He and his priesthood will last forever. To coin a popular phrase, Death has no authority here, no authority at all. On that third day, Jesus broke the chains of death. He was raised to life, and now he lives forevermore. And so can we, if we put our faith in this same Jesus Christ, our great high priest. I pray that you won't let that invitation pass you by. Tell you what, if you like uplifting verses, you won't want to miss verse 25. Notice that Jesus is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. Notice that Jesus can save completely those who come to God as long as we go through him. Remember, Jesus himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. To use a sat-nav analogy, no shortcuts, no diversions, no alternative routes. The only way to the Father is through the Son, Jesus Christ. And notice it's this same Jesus who intercedes or intervenes for us on our behalf. How reassuring is it to know that this same Jesus intercedes for you. When we don't know what to say, do, or pray, he intervenes between us and Almighty God. In fact, he lives to intercede for us. Then look, finally, at the list of attributes in verses 26 to 28. Jesus is holy, blameless, set apart from sinners like you and me. Um, and he's exalted above the heavens. Words that can only describe this God-man, Jesus Christ, no one else. Notice in the Old Testament, the high priest had to offer sacrifices for himself and everyone else. But in these verses, we're reminded that Jesus doesn't need to do either. Why? Because Jesus was the sacrifice. It is Jesus who shed his blood on the cross to forgive our sins. It is Jesus who removes our sins from us. And it is Jesus who saves us from the power and the penalty of our sins. And that's why Jesus is the only way to the Father. No one else has the credentials. 
The final word on this is that Jesus' sacrifice was once and for all in verse 27. Now we can all enter into the presence of God. Remember that torn temple curtain and as we heard on Pentecost Sunday, with his Holy Spirit in our lives, uh, we can know his power at work within us. Thanks for listening. There will be some questions on the Facebook page to help you with deeper personal private study. And also, hopefully, you'll find an opportunity to use those uh, in your small groups. Have a great day. Thanks for listening.